Amen. All right, well, we are in Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. Ephesians chapter 5, looking at the subject, the church in all its earthly glory. The church in all its earthly glory. Now, you're probably thinking, and ha having been in Bible college and seminary, and a lot of us uh, when we were younger, uh, that we thought the church in all its earthly glory meant uh, that uh, Sunday services had standing room only. We were rocking the house. We had awesome light shows. We, we, had, uh, pro we had more programs than we had people. We, th we thought that those were the metrics for the church in all its earthly glory. When the pastor is uh, almost as popular as Jesus and sometimes more popular, some churches think that that's the church in all its earthly glory. But you're going to find something in this passage today that I had not considered until just this week. And there were several things, uh, it, it actually goes back probably about six months when God uh, began to impress upon me an emphasis that we need here more than ever because I don't think any of us are aloof to the fact that the family is disintegrating. We don't have to look far at all. We could probably... If I were to ask you for testimonies this morning of families uh, that are downright crazy and dysfunctional, we'd be here all day because, truthfully, a lot of us have those relatives. We have those people in the family that we don't want to talk about. And sometimes, let's be honest, and, 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 and we're not creating a... Uh, uh, any condemnation or anything, but sometimes that hits right within our four walls. Things get to the point where we're just hoping we can get by. We're hoping we can survive another day within our family unit because everything is just crazy. It's insane. We are praying for God to save loved ones. We're praying for wandering loved ones to come home. We're, we're praying all kinds of things, but right now we're having to deal with the reality that they're not there yet. So, if I were to give you the sermon in a sentence, I'm going to go ahead and give you that in the beginning. The church in all its earthly glory, or is in its, all its earthly glory, when its families are functioning biblically. The church is in all its earthly glory when its families are functioning biblically. You might think, well, Matthew, you, you, you made that up. That sounds mighty eloquent. Well, I'll, I'll show you here in Ephesians chapter 5 that I found it right here in the Scriptures. Something else that I want to throw out I, was, I had a three-hour conversation catching up with an old pastor friend of mine, and he was sharing about some of the churches uh, in a, the area we both had ministered in that area. That's where he's from and where I served for six years. And he talked about one of the churches in the area. He said that, and, and, and I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to shed negative light, but this is the sad reality of some churches. This is not the first time I've heard this of any church. But he said, unfortunately, this church that was once thriving uh, has lost its edge, it's lost uh, its pastor, it's lost several of its members because it is known in town as the wife-swapping church. Don't want anybody get any ideas. But it was known as the wife swapping church. Everybody was, there was, it sounds like the church of Corinth if you want to look in it scripturally. But there is so much immorality going on and it's led to the church's demise. 
I don't, I don't stand up here today bragging. I stand up here broken because that, like I said, is the case, not just with that church, but it's been with a lot of churches. I've been in churches where it has happened in the past. And any of us, when we take our eyes off Jesus, could easily fall into any of that. But I, I, I would long for Oasis Church to reflect the glory of God because our families are healthy and biblically functioning. So hang with me a minute as we get to that one focal verse. I, I want to read the passage of Scripture, though, and I want to go back to Ch uh, Ch Ephesians 5, excuse me, starting in verse 17. I'm going to read the entire passage, and then I want to bring out some points that I pray will be helpful. Now... Please, for those of you who are, are uh, maybe widowed or a widower or, or, or single or whatever the case is, please don't check out on me. Because it would be easy to think, oh, I'm by myself and I don't have to deal with any of that junk. <laughs> but we need to be praying for the home. We need to be praying for the family. Ephesians 5.17 so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not, be, uh, uh, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. So anybody wondering if drunkenness is alright, there's your answer. But don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And let me go ahead and make a comment that's totally unrelated to the message. But there are some people that say, think oh, that I, they can be drunk with the Spirit. That's not a biblical term. Just in case any of y'all think, oh, I'm going to get drunk with the Spirit. No, you get filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one, or, one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of the, our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one to another in the fear of Christ. So we see these first few verses being about the filling of the Holy Spirit. And in essence, God uh, getting more of us. Uh, we don't get more of Him. We, when He gives us the Holy Spirit, He gives us all of the Holy Spirit. But we don't always surrender all of us. We, we have a tendency to surrender portions Lord, I'll give you a little bit today and I'll give you a little bit next month and so on and so forth. But when you and I get filled with the Spirit, He in essence is getting more of us. And the result is that we speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So it's, it's, a, it's a mutual encouragement that's going on. But then it also says singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. So there's a vertical change that takes place. A horizontal change, but also a vertical change. Always, notice always, giving thanks. If you know a grouch who is a grouch 24-7, I can guarantee they're not a spirit-filled believer. At least not Holy Spirit-filled. They, they, they might have some other spirits that influence them, but... Anyway, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And it says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And then Paul dares to flesh this out in reference to the home. He starts getting in your business about being a godly husband, a godly wife, a godly father, a godly mother. And some of the terminology that he uses, will pro it may trigger some people in this room and it may trigger some of those who will be watching by Facebook. But it is the Bible and I must go there. Verse 22, it says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body... But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands and everything. 
Let me, let, let me say, first of all, I, I told you I'd read the whole passage. I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just break it down piece by piece. Wives are under the husband's spiritual covering. Well, you say, Matthew, what if I'm married to a jerk? Some of y'all are laughing. I hope you're not laughing because that's the case. But what if I'm married to a jerk? You are under the husband's spiritual covering. Let's go back to verse 20. Wives be subject, or some, some translations say, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. That is a, like I said, a triggering word. And it has been a word that has been abused. I'll give you an example of how it's been abused. It, it does not give husbands a, a free uh, ticket to be a jerk. That is not the case. But I, I know of a missionary one time, true story. Uh, a friend of mine told me that he was at a missions conference, a bunch of missionaries, and this one guy decides that he's going to show off how submissive his wife is. So he's standing there being the pompous thing that he is and says, Honey, come over here. So watch this, guys. I want, I want you to see that my wife submits to me. <laughs> Crawl to me, baby. She said, Honey, don't, don't make me do that. So Crawl to me. And she crawled to him. My unsanctified self wanted to say after she crawled to him, she should have gotten off the floor and slapped him. Can I get, can I get a witness? <laughs> some of y'all are unsanctified too. But some people think that is submission and it's not. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Paul's going to explain this a little more in a minute, and you're going to see that husbands don't have it as easy as people try to take in just one verse. Because there's a responsibility, a heavy responsibility, that a lot of husbands are not stepping up and doing. Verse 24, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands and everything. Like I said, these, these are hard words, for, uh, especially if you have had a husband who has not been a, a godly man. It's hard to say, I trust your leadership. But notice that husbands are to represent Christ to the family. Look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. And notice this, and gave himself up for her. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. I want to jump down. To verse 28, so husbands ought also to love their own body or their own wives as their own bodies. I know some men on a real ego trip that if they love their wives that much, there'd be a whole lot of love going on. For it goes on to say, He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. It is interesting, if you look at this, God is asking men and women both to do things that are often not so natural for us. Sometimes men are so tough that to... To use terminology like nourish and cherish, that's a little tough. Because we're so busy trying to prove that we're manly, that we don't do the thing that God calls us to do and sacrificially love and selflessly love our wives. Man should be saying something right about now. <laughs> but 
It's the truth, though. We get so busy being the, uh, the financial provider, we get so busy doing all these other things that we often forget that we have a responsibility before God to nourish and cherish our wives. But we've got to do what Scripture tells us to do. We've got to tell us, uh, do what God tells us to do. And unfortunately, the, uh, the church is not demonstrating what a home ought to look like because husbands and wives aren't doing the things we've already talked about so far. But I want you to notice a third thing, that this biblical model reveals the glory of God through the church. This biblical model reveals the glory of God through the church. Let me go back to verse 25 and, 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 and put the sentence into context. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her, so that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the Word. Lean in now on verse 27. That He might present to Himself the church in all her glory. So if the family is functioning right and, and, and word gets out that Oasis has a bunch of healthy families, we are a family-oriented church, a biblically sound family-oriented church. We demonstrate God's glory. That He might present to Himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would, she would be holy and blameless. I want us to be that kind of church. I want us to be that kind of church because God wants us to be that kind of church. I don't ever want to have any desires that are outside of Scripture for Oasis Church. Because families, most people don't even know what a family is anymore. Let's be honest. We are so confused and the media is intensifying that confusion and now nobody knows. Even church people, people who have been in evangelical churches for decades don't have a clue what a biblical family is supposed to be. Because, oh, you know, that, that Bible stuff's a little antiquated, they say. And oh, you know, that, that's, that's a little old school. we got to bend with the times. Let me ask you a question. What good has bending with the times done? Has it made us stronger or has it made us weak and pathetic? The latter. The biblical model reveals God's glory through the church. The, we, when we think about the church in all its glory, we think about, oh, I can't wait to get, he, get to heaven. I can't wait to, to uh, experience what the worship team sang about this morning. But we are called to reveal God's glory and, and, and proclaim God's glory on this side of heaven. Or otherwise, there are going to be a whole lot fewer people in heaven because we're not revealing his truth. Let's go on. Verse uh, 28. So husbands ought to love their own, body, or their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave uh, or be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. It's no longer about me and you, it's about oneness. When Jennifer and I got married, we became one flesh. Verse 32 says, This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. It's interesting that he takes the marriage and he takes the church and, and, and he 
shows a reflection of the two. Nevertheless, verse 33, each individual among you is also to love his wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. I know right now all of our children are in the back, pretty much, except Madison over here. <laughs> I'm calling her out. But, no, this, the, these next few verses... Child, uh, fathers, uh, excuse me, children are to obey. Verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. I remember sitting in a Bible class as a child hearing this, and I thought, oh no, if I don't honor my father and my mother, I'm going to drop dead. So, uh, and, and don't go thinking that everybody that dies at a young age was horrible to their parents, because that's not the case. But it, it put the fear of God into me. I thought, I better at least you know, try to do my best to obey them. I wasn't perfect. Sometimes I believe my mother thinks that I walked on water because I was the only child, but... I always tried to obey my parents. Now there were times when I, I pushed the limits. And my dad, I, I, I knew. Now my mom, she was a little more long-suffering, but my dad, not so much. I don't know if your, any of your parents or any of you as parents had the look. <laughs> but when I pushed the limits with my dad, my dad had the look. And the look was blood red face and eyes rolled up in the head. And when I saw that look, I knew that I was about to get something applied to where I sit. So I better start, start stepping back. I had a tendency sometimes to be a little... Um, I don't know if sarcastic would be the right word, but I'd smart off at my dad. And, and I learned very, at a very young age, one time, it was all it took. So anytime that I got close and he got the look, I backed up. Do you know why? Because I wanted to live long on the earth. And I felt like that that uh, application of discipline might take me out. It didn't. And, and thankfully, I didn't have to have any of those after the age of 11. Praise God. But children have a responsibility. And then, I know some of y'all were wishing, oh, if I'd only kept my kids in here today <laughs> instead of sending them to the back. But then fathers must guide rather than provoke. Notice verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I never understood what this meant until there were times when I operated in the flesh as a father. And I found myself in frustration because of their behavior, I found myself provoking them and putting fuel on the fire. And then all of a sudden, bam, the Holy Spirit brought to mind, Matthew, you are doing what Ephesians 6, 4 says don't do, and that's provoke your children to anger. But I am supposed to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. There are times when I have to correct them, and I have to correct them strongly. In love. God the Father does that to us, His children. When we get out of, uh, out of line, He corrects us. Because He loves us. And He doesn't want us to wander off track. He wants us to get back on track and live out His will for our lives. Why would I preach a message 
like this. Because the disintegration of the home drives me to preach it. And because I believe with all my heart that if, if there's anything that we need to do in, in this season of ministry is to intensify our ministry to families. I have discovered that most men in the church have no clue how to be a godly husband, how to be a godly father, because they never had anybody to teach them. I have discovered that most women in the church don't know how to be a godly wife, godly woman, godly mother, because they didn't have anybody to teach them. And a lot of times, here's what churches do. I can't believe you're acting like that. Get right or get out. God forbid we take that, that posture. Most people act the way they do because nobody ever taught them. They don't know better. They, they, they might have encountered one person here or there who told them some things, but they didn't have it consistently modeled and so much of life is caught rather than taught. And what you know as the norm in your household, it's a hard habit to break. I have seen uh, times when uh, couples split up. And rather than somebody coming along and trying to help them reconcile, they just tell them how wrong they are. Well, I think they're pretty uh, understanding of the fact that something went wrong along the way. That, that's like the obvious. But how do we fix all the things that led to this mess we're in? The church should be loving and taking uh, women taking women under their wing and men taking men under their wing and couples taking couples under their wing so that we can flesh out what Hebrews 10.25 is really all about. If we think that Hebrews 10.25 is just about us coming together like we're doing this morning and then walking out the door, that is far. That's, a, that's like this much of the big picture of encouraging one another and exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Oasis Church, what are we going to do? I bet right now if you thought about it, you could think of a lady in this church who could benefit from your love and concern and, and help. I bet right now if you thought about it, you could think about a, a man in this church who you, uh, you older men could take under your wing and help them because they're flailing around and they're struggling and they think they got this thing right and, and they're wondering... Why they're in the mess they're in. Or maybe you, you seasoned couples who've been at this a minute can take some uh, struggling younger couple under your wing. I don't know how all of this is going to be fleshed out. But the beautiful part about it is you don't need me to initiate it. The Holy Spirit does a wonderful job of initiating, putting things in your heart to do to help others in the body of Christ. I don't have to micromanage it. I'll encourage it. If you need some help along the way and you call me and say, Matthew, hey, I'm, I'm a little stumped about something. If I don't have the answer, I'll, I'll pray about it and... Pray that either I can give it to you or somebody else can. I envision this being a multi-generational church. A church where every, uh, every generation has what they need spiritually to thrive. Not just survive because that's most of what everybody's doing these days. They're doing what they can to survive and get by. 
My prayer, the vision that God has put in my heart is that our family ministries go to a new level. What I want you to do is pray about that very thing. God, how can you use me to help? Because here's the thing that that I've seen. You may not be able to reach the adults so much, but you sure can reach the adults through the kids. The kids are quicker to come to church a lot of times than the adults. You have a child-friendly event, they're dying to go. The parent's not going to come on their own, but the the kid begs and pulls on their arm until they get here. (laughs) It's, it's, It's just the way that it is. So I want us to ask God, God, what do you want me to do to help us become that kind of church? to reveal the glory of God because we have healthy family units that are putting Christ on display. I want that to be our prayer this morning. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, this morning... My heart breaks Lord because I know what it's like to be a home that's been destroyed I know what it's like to to be a guy on ministry staff that felt that he had to pretend to the whole world that everything was perfect when It was chaos. Fearing that if anybody knew the reality of what was going on behind the scenes, I would get nothing but stone throwers rather than people that would try to help me up. God, I believe that there are enough people in this church, not not stone throwers, But people who'd see somebody who's fallen, give them a hand up. Point them to the tools they need to be victorious in Christ. God, I don't know what all this will look like. But I know... Right now that there are families all around us that are in a mess. And God, I'm so sick and tired of it that I I don't want to just accept that that's the way that it is. God, I want us to take just a few minutes to pray for families. Not out loud, but just quietly where you are. Some of you, it's, it's your personal family. Maybe it's your children. Grandchildren. Sisters, brothers, I don't know. But here in this moment, I just want us to take time to quietly pray. Pray for victory in in the lives, in these homes that are on the verge of divorce. For children that are on the verge of running away from the faith. Or children who have run away from the faith and need to come back. 
children who are lost and need to be saved. God, we know that there is a, an outright satanic attack on the, on the home. There is a satanic attack on marriages. Because they know if, the enemy knows if he can mess up a marriage, then he can mess with the lives of the children and mess up a whole lot of other lives as a result. God, I pray for protection over every couple in this church. God, I pray that today that they would leave with a greater resolve to, uh, to be a godly husband, a godly wife, a godly couple, godly parents. That God, we wouldn't take the home flippantly, but we would take it seriously. Through our homes, we want to display your glory. God, I pray for those in this church who could be a mentor. Lord, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that's you know, formal and, and rigid. You could be putting some woman on the heart of a lady in this church to maybe just call and check in periodically. Maybe get together for coffee or get together for prayer. Same with man to man. Or maybe some, some couple just take another couple say, hey, let's, let's, let's meet at the park. Well, let's take a walk together. I, I don't know how that's going to look. But God, we need more of it. We need more of it. So God, I, I, I trust that your spirit is speaking into the hearts of people in this room today. Someone within this church body, or maybe somebody outside this church body that they can help, they can sow into. God, you didn't bring them along this far just so they could sit there and keep it to themselves. God, you want us to give as you've given to us. God, help us. Shape us into a multi-generational church. A church that equips Men to be godly men, husbands and fathers. That equips women to be godly women, mothers and wives. A church that equips couples, not only to be godly couples, but godly parents. And then we take the, the children to, we, that we, uh, to which you have entrusted us. And, and that we would sow into them... So that when they get out into the real world and their faith is challenged, they are able to give an answer of the hope that lies within them. God, make us a church that prays, prays bold prayers. And may we keep praying bold prayers until we see them answered. And when we see them answered, may we keep pray, praying more bold prayers. And may we keep going and keep going and keep going because that's what you've called us to do. Lord, as we go from here, accomplish all that you want to do in and through Oasis Church. 
May we give you all the glory as we demonstrate your glory in and through lives that are yielded to you. This is our prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen.